Hey guys, it's Edbert. So today I wanted to do a video on this thread that I found about rewriting the Uber app. Now, for those who don't know, back in 2016, Uber actually rewrote their entire iOS app from Objective-C to Swift. Now, this actually sounds like a really incredible project that anyone would be happy to work on. But the thing is that behind all the smoke and mirrors and the flashy app was a very, very harrowing story that I think a lot of you will actually run into during your career. Specifically, what I'm talking about is a project where people begin to lose faith in its efficacy. This story right here is about reputation, politics, and the sunken cost fallacy, where you basically just keep trying to push the project because you've already sunk X amount of cost into it. The reason why it's a fallacy is because that time that you put in, those resources, whatever you did, you're not going to get them back. And it's really important to understand this part of human nature because at the end of the day, it's humans who are writing the application, not robots. Even though the code is deterministic, human behavior is not. And what I want you to take away from this is that even though so much about engineering is about collaboration, discussing with other people, at the end of the day, a decision does need to be made. And that moment when you need to make a decision is what will show who you are and how brilliant of an engineer you are. And that's why I believe the number one thing you can have as an engineer isn't knowledge, it's your ability to make decisions. So with that, let's begin. So I'm going to be reading off of Stan Twinby's Twitter. And for those who do not know, he led the effort to refactor Uber's iOS app into Swift. So he's a very key player in all of this. Currently, he's a principal engineer at Amazon. So this situation, no matter how stupid you might think it is, was because of a bunch of brilliant people who came together and thought they had a very good idea and were making the correct decision. All right, folks, gather around and let me tell you the story of almost the biggest engineering disaster I've had the misfortune of being involved with. It's a tale of politics, architecture, and the sunk cost fallacy. The year is 2016. Donald Trump was not yet the president. Therefore, delete Uber movement hadn't happened yet. TK was still the CEO, and we were still in the hypergrowth phase of international rollout. Public sentiment was overwhelmingly positive, and Uber was riding high. But hypergrowth was not without its problems, and the app itself was starting to show some cracks. The engineering org had doubled in size almost every year prior, and when you grow that fast, you end up with an incredibly wide range of skill. That paired with a hacking mentality that we call let builders build meant that app architecture was complicated and fragile. Uber at the time was extremely heavy on client-side logic, so the app would break a lot. We were constantly doing hotfixes, burning releases, etc. The design was also scaling badly. So a few things. First of all, TK stands for Travis Kalanick, who was the prior CEO to Dara Kowalski. He's saying that in 2016, Uber had just started their hiring spree and were trying to move as fast as possible. And some of the problems that really come from this is that you start to transition from a monolith to a scalable and modular architecture. What you really find is that these teams need to be able to move in parallel without stepping on each other's toes. And while you might know a lot about the native SDK that it's built on, the fact of the matter is that architecture exists to limit your choices so that you do not shoot yourself in the foot. A lot of these components that the SDK gives you also affect other modules. And the purpose of scalable architecture is to be able to put you in a container and a box. And while we might think that the lack of freedom is a bad thing, the fact of the matter is that for the app, it's a good thing because the walls that you're put in are built there for a reason. So that way, no matter how much you push on them, you do not affect anyone else. When you deal with thousands of components, you don't have time to troubleshoot every little thing that comes your way because sometimes just not dealing with a problem is so much simpler, easier, and more efficient from an organizational level. Let's continue. So a team was formed to build a new mobile architecture for this app. The driving charter for the team was to build an architecture that would sustain mobile development at Uber for the next five years. We did both platforms at once. Product and design also started over. So this is kind of understandable. App rewrites are really expensive though, and should really be considered a last resort. If anything, everyone just tries to refactor a project towards its ideal state. You would rather spend one to two years doing that and eventually getting to your ideal app state than to spend, you know, six months doing nothing but rewriting the app from the ground up. The reason for this is that for one, you don't even know if the direction you're heading in is even correct. And if you marry yourself to the solution way too soon and the solution ends up being wrong, then you're not gonna have anything to show for it. In fact, you might end up warranting a rewrite again. Furthermore, you're basically spending six months on a new product that leads to no profits. It's exactly the same product as before. You're investing in your app and eating a loss upfront in order to try and reap the benefits in terms of efficiency later. I would say this five-year timeline is pretty long in the app world. Most code doesn't even make it to three years. So a five-year plan is actually quite ambitious when you really think about it. As time goes on, the architecture evolves as business need evolves. 
And eventually, the code architecture does not even resemble what it once supported because there are new requirements, new decisions that are being made. And this app architecture slowly becomes like molded, twisted into this new form that barely resembles the business case and use cases that it used to support. On the iOS side of the world, the rewrite presented an opportunity to adopt Swift, which was in version 2.x during this time span. Uber had tried Swift before, but like many who had adopted it that early on, it was extremely problematic. So it had been banned prior to the rewrite. But the general feeling of the architecture team was that most of Swift's problems centered around the flakiness of the Objective-C interop back then. So if we wrote a purely Swift app, we could avoid the major issues. I think this is pretty common. Swift was official in 2014 and two years in, it still had problems. The interop he is talking about refers to the ability for each language to use each other in the same project. This is not unlike what Kotlin and Java have today, where each programming language can call functions and variables of the other. Shiny tech looks great. But it always comes with issues. I think that's something that we often forget when we try to keep up with the latest and greatest tech. For a large-scale organization, not only do you scale your efforts and results, but you also scale your mistakes. One wrong commitment to the wrong tech, and your entire code base can be toast. There was also a push to use the same major architectural patterns on Android and iOS. The Android folks at the time were big fans of Arc's Java, and there was an equivalent Arc Swift library that took advantage of the functional programming paradigms in Swift. It seems pretty straightforward. And so we're going to talk a little bit about why you want to keep consistency on two platforms. You want mobile developers on iOS and Android to collaborate and share the same design for the sake of efficiency. You can create one design for two platforms instead of two different designs. Because iOS and Android are going to have their own styles, their own patterns, and what the SDK and architecture provides. So what if you design something that allows iOS engineers and Android engineers to communicate and use similar components so that way they can share the same design in the same ERD? This also allows developers to read each other's codes and to be able to translate ideas from one language to another. At the same time, it still keeps people in their lanes. There are nuances where pure iOS developers and pure Android developers are really going to understand and know. And you really don't want to do the same work twice just to support the same feature. And finally, I think reactive programming comes with its own issues, but it's a very powerful tool and you'd be very hard pressed to find a company that doesn't use some form of this. And it's not something that you really learn in college because I believe that it came out in probably 2011, 2012 and really hadn't been integrated into the college curriculum. In fact, I'd be surprised if college students today taught some form of Rx. But at the same time, if you're going to become a developer in today's world, it's really important that you actually learn how to use reactive programming. The reason why it's favored is because it handles a lot of thread switching and being able to do asynchronous callbacks and be able to transform data that is flowing through a stream and transform it into something that is predictable on the output without having to write some crazy locks or manipulations. So the smaller core team of design, product, and architecture went off in a room for with their new functional reactive patterns, new language, and new app for a few months. Everything went well. The architecture relied heavily on the advanced languages features of Swift. The UI design was scalable for the growing number of products that Uber offered. The functional programming paradigm was powerful, albeit a bit of a learning curve. The architecture centered around our new real-time stream-based networking protocol. That's the part I wrote. It's the honeymoon phase. Now, you might be wondering why design is needed. With architecture at scale, you really can't have every single module try to redefine the same resource of styling. Why not have a universal style? And I think this is also one of the mistakes of adopting new things. It hasn't been battle tested. There's a reason why MySQL is chosen as the default over NoSQL. The 25 years it has on it and the several server years, if not several millennia, have made it a tried and true tech with common issues already known and solved for. But when you're adopting something new, you also adopt its mistakes, many of them unknown. I mean, yeah, it does exactly what the business requirements were and it seemed to work really well as a toy example. So why not believe in it? After a few months and a number of flashy demos later, the momentum was building. The project was looking like a success. They had built amazing experiences in a short amount of time with a small number of engineers. Most of the core product was built out. The execs were sold. So the company-wide rollout began. Teams began focusing all their focus to bringing their features to the new app. At first, the excitement of the new feature created a flurry of motivation and productivity. The architecture was built for feature isolation, which allowed teams to move fast. But once Swift started to scale past 10 engineers, the wheels started coming off. The Swift compiler was still so much slower than Objective-C, but back then it was practically unusable. Build times went through the roof. Type ahead debugging stopped working entirely. There's a video of someone in one of our talks of an Uber engineer typing a single line statement in Xcode and then waiting 45 seconds for the letter to appear in the editor slowly, one by one. 
So just to clarify, type ahead is the feature in computers where if the computer is lagging and you continue to type, those keystrokes do get processed eventually and show up later. Then we hit a wall with a dynamic linker. At the time, you could only link Swift libraries dynamically. Unfortunately, the linker executed in polynomial time. So Apple's recommended maximum number of libraries was a single binary was six. We had 92 and counting. As a result, it took eight to 12 seconds after tapping the app icon before main was even called. Our shiny new app was slower than the old clunky one. Then the binary size problem hit. It might've been a while since you've actually looked at compilers, but linker in this case refers to the compiler linker. Every single time a language gets updated, there are small little release notes that get attached to it. Now, most people don't really look at it. They only look at the big major flashy new features like in Java 9, where they introduced Lambda expressions. But those small little notes, those small little tidbits and tweaks that they say will actually haunt you in a really big way. And that's why deciding whether or not to upgrade or not is an extremely big issue. But regardless, it's not great to have a massive application because it means it takes longer to download. And for people who really just need the app on the go, they have very little patience. So in fact, even waiting just 100 seconds for your app to download, your users are losing attention after five seconds. How do you even expect them to remember you after 100 seconds, unless you keep them constantly engaged? And part of that experience is having an app that's quickly available and ready. But to answer Tapball's original question, when the problem started showing up in earnest, we were way past the point of no return. And this is where the sunk cost fallacy applies. At this point, the whole company was pouring its energy into the new app. Thousands of people across every discipline, millions and millions, I can't tell you the real number, but it's way more than $1 had been spent. The whole management chain was fully bought in. And I privately had the we need to stop conversation with my director. He told me that if this project fails, he might as well pack his bags. The same was true for his boss all the way up to the VP. There was no way out. Uh, And this is a really nasty problem that you have with people in politics. And I don't mean in terms of like, you know, taking credit for someone else's work or the nasty way you might think of politics or Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Rather, I mean it in terms of reputation. To do a change of this size, you need buy-in from multiple people and multiple organizations. These people who are giving you buy-in are supporting your effort and giving you their time. Time that can be spent on something else, on something more profitable. So... What message are you saying when you say, oh, I know I wasted three months of your cycle on this, but it's not working out. We're going to revert it. How do you get people to believe in you again? How do they know it won't end up like this the next time? Loss of trust is a very big thing. And for a project at this scale, it's not just this one person. It's that person's manager, that person's teammate, their teammates. It spreads. It spreads at the lunch table and it kills company morale very easily. So we rolled up our sleeves and put our best people to each of the problems and prioritized the launch critical issues, dynamic linking and binary size. I was assigned to both dynamic linking and binary size in that order. We quickly discovered that putting all our code in the main executable solved the linking problem at App Startup. But as we know, Swift conflates namespacing with frameworks. So to do so would take a huge code change involving countless namespace checks. So let's actually look at the Swift compiler details. Remember, the original issue is the high app startup time because of the linker being run on 96 libraries instead of the recommended six at app startup. But what this is saying is that after the object files are generated after the assembler process in the compilation process, the linker will try to find the references in object files that refer to other object files or libraries and link them together. I assume that by putting everything in the main executable, they mean shoving everything into a single module and then building that module. And I believe the risk that he's talking about is that when you refactor a code from a bunch of other modules and cram them into one module, you end up in a very scary scenario where package names become ambiguous and it's unknown which specific class class names refer to. So let's suppose that your package A has class foo and package B has class foo and you refer to foo. Is it foo from package A or is it foo from package B? That's when the brilliant Richard Howe I'm not sure if he's on Twitter, discovered while reading the Xcode build output that he could take all the intermediate object files and relink them back into the main executable with a custom script after the build was complete. Since Swift mangles the object namespace into the symbol name itself at compile time, this meant that he could safely preserve the namespacing while doing this. This allowed us to effectively statically link our libraries and cut our pre-main time from 10 to basically zero. So what is he saying? He's saying here that the hack is to add one more step to the compile process. Instead of dynamically linking the libraries on app startup, you can link them after the build process is complete so that they are already linked when the app is installed and goes to startup. What makes this possible is the fact that namespaces and frameworks don't share the same name when they get turned into object files. So if you know that a framework corresponds to a particular name of an output file, you can just directly link that. 
Next problem, app size. At the time, we were planning to include the new app into the old app bundle and roll it out slowly at runtime as a safety net. First thing we did to buy space was just remove the old app. We call this release strategy YOLO. What they would have had to do is ship two apps and slowly say, hey, this percentage of the population gets the new app. This percentage of the population gets the old app. Imagine, imagine your CEO actually saying, fuck it, we're doing it live. We're doing it fucking live. We also replaced all our Swift trucks with classes. Value types in general have a ton of overhead due to object flattening and the extra machine code needed for the copy behavior and auto initializers. This saved us space, so we pressed on. I'm not sure what this refers to. Object flattening would imply turning a class into a string representation of itself, but this is a struct, so I'm not quite sure how this works under the hood. I assume that a struct will have a bunch of boilerplate code associated with its creation, whereas you can just define the functions you want in a class. So if anyone here is a compiler engineer and can understand this, please let me know in the comments. As the app kept growing, soon we hit the cellular download limit, 100 megabytes, for our universal binaries, iOS and earlier. This represented a substantial amount of lost signups. The amount of dollars it would cost us is in the order of eight figures, the people who hadn't upgraded yet. All right, so the binary size problem is that for most platforms that distribute content like the Google Play Store or iOS, they limit the size of your app because they don't want you to send gigabytes of data over cellular, destroying people's phone plans and data limits. So after a certain size, they make the app Wi-Fi only. And basically what he's saying is that just having it on Wi-Fi only would cost them a shit ton of money. And he goes on to explain what exactly this issue is later on in the thread. So at this point, we were weeks away from the public launch date. We had graciously received help from a certain company that I'm still under NDA with, but they couldn't solve our problems. The only thing we could do was regenerate the model code, 25% of the total line count back into Objective-C or drop support for iOS 8. Since iOS 9 had introduced individual architecture, slicing it was effectively half the size, give or take. With only a week left, we decided to eat the eight figures and drop support for iOS 8. The general thinking was that at half the size, we still had plenty of runway with the iOS 9 binary. And after the rewrite was done, we could solve the problem some, sometime way down the road because things would slow down a bit. We were unfortunately completely wrong about that. I'd be shooting bricks here. So imagine an outside company can't help you fix your problems. But it makes sense. If you're already committed to one step, you're more likely to commit to the next step and the next step and the next step. And that's kind of what you're seeing here. Because they had sunk their reputation into a project with a lot of issues, they basically had to do a hard commit to everything that resulted from that. Remember that YOLO that they said? They already decided to not incrementally roll out the app for space. So if the space reason is causing you to make one decision and it comes back, then it's going to force your hand for another decision and another one and another one. In coding and engineering, the best option is almost always the one that gives you the most options going forward when building out new features or, you know, modifying old ones. And they're running into a play that forces them to remove their future options because they've already committed themselves to one endeavor and whatever consequences of that endeavor are, they have to tackle it instead of being able to defer that down the road. And yeah, being able to make it to that first safe haven of release so we can buy ourselves some time is actually the correct decision here. The, but the whole line of reasoning to actually make it there was essentially forced because people weren't willing to capitulate and re-examine the effort in the first place. In fact, I would say the first sign of trouble was that builder and linker issue. After the app release, we threw a huge party. The app was well received by the press. It was fast, snappy, with a fast new design. A bunch of people got promoted. We all breathed a sigh of relief. The 90 hour work weeks stopped for a few weeks. Honestly, good for them. You know, like I remember when I was part of the Apple Music rewrite um, for the Android app and it was largely well received. And we were actually two cycles behind iOS because of it, but it was a very good feeling to move towards a more flexible and scalable architecture that wasn't going to constantly crash on us. Uh, you know, bugs always happen, but at least the immediate threat of developer burnout is not there. And you have something that you can ride off of for a few weeks while people recover. Uh, this was actually released back in 2016, 2017. Oh, 2017. Wow. Time flies. But yeah, like um, just to give you a quick preview of what was going on, um, essentially we had migrated from an old Beats flavored app over to a sidebar version of the iOS app. And we had instigated two-factor authentication into a lot of the accounts as well. I think the real big part of all this that a lot of people forget is that developer burnout is actually real. Like, have you ever been involved in a project where you just desperately did not want to do any other work. You would rather cut off your own hands than to do it. That's one big part of attrition of people leaving is that they feel like they just can't move the needle. There's nothing else that they can do. Um, and so if your developers quit, who will be there to fix the new stuff? 
But then the public sentiment started to shift. The new app was centered around letting the customer enter the destination first so they could get the price up front. Without the manual pickup location entry, people's location would just show up wherever the GPS location was last received. This can be very inaccurate, especially in cities with tall buildings, and drivers would end up on the wrong block. This is a horrible customer experience. Yeah, you have a key feature of your application breaking as a result of this migration. Deprioritizing this to protect your developers was, I think, the right move. But it's really, really bad having a key feature break in the wild. It's like, imagine Facebook doesn't show you the timeline of people's feeds or erroneously shows it from 12 hours ago. That's not a great user experience. And it's a key part of what's driving your app. So I would expect that something like this would be a P1 or P0 immediately after launch and marked as a fast follow and fixed within a week. And I suspect that this was an issue that they knew about before going into the launch. This is kind of a between a rock and a hard place. The decision to full on commit to this rewrite was a very flaky endeavor already, and it burned one key resource, your developer burnout prevention. So now you don't really have anything to protect you when something like this, something that is major and unforeseen becomes a really big problem. And a lot of these issues tend to come quite frequently as a result of a lot of these big rewrites. So to improve the location pickup, we changed the location permission to collect signal in the background so we could send the drivers to your current location. People freaked out. Some of my ex-Twitter colleagues called on me to quit such an evil company that would track you like this. As a result of said freakout, people turned off their location permissions, but the new app hadn't designed any experience to handle this use case. So I think a lot of people really take these, oh my God, these apps are tracking you issues in completely the wrong way. 99% of the time, it's just hacks and people not understanding what the core tech does underneath and abusing it the wrong way. And by people, I mean developers. And this is just kind of one common instance, hacking your way to buy yourself some time and get the app to work on a basic level. Another example of this is like when a game asks you for a bunch of these permissions that are not necessary. For instance, why would a game app require permission for your phone's contacts, you know? Um, and most likely the person who created the app followed a bunch of tutorials and slapped together a bunch of Stack Overflow answers and tried a bunch of hacks in order to try and just get it to work, including adding app permissions that they don't need. The system will notify the end user about these permissions. So to the user, it'll look like a huge invasion of privacy when the reality is that the developer just didn't know what they were doing. But with time, a lot of these small apps and companies evolved to the point where these small mistakes and their consequences are very easily and well understood. This particular situation is just an unfortunate situation where the consequences just kind of blew up in their face and they really didn't have an answer for that. So we scrambled to fill the back experience. We debated turning the background location off, but then it would destroy the customer experience at pickup time again. Then after the Trump got in the White House, this was about three months after the new app release, this set off a chain reaction that led to the start of the delete Uber movement. This also created another thread, but basically the NYC taxi union seized upon the outrage created by the travel ban to accuse Uber off strike breaking by turning off surge at LaGuardia. This was a complete lie. Without surge pricing, the supply immediately dries up. No one will drive to the airport without extra incentive for them to go there, but the lie went viral. Again, you kind of decide between whether or not you want your app to actually work or your app to have bad PR. And I think that I want to pivot this to turn towards a point that is very underrated and very often overlooked by developers. The smallest mistakes that you make as a developer can bite you in the ass in a lot of different ways. And most of the time we focus on the development part. For instance, we only focus on the app crashing. Sometimes it's just the bugs. Other times it's just other people not being able to write their code. But I don't think a lot of people really think about it in terms of the company's reputation and business. And while we might have safeguards like linters, CICD checks, Jenkins for the development aspect, there really isn't one for public perception. And it's important that as a dev, you understand the business side of things. I mean, in this particular case, the development requirement for a user to be picked up at a certain location is met. But the business side of things is going to shit because, again, this invasion of privacy looks like bad PR. And then as a result of that, as a result of that vulnerability, other people who are competitors to Uber actually seize on that opportunity. And this is just one example of things that people really have to be aware of, especially if you're a developer. What will the business impact of your decision or mistake be? You aren't just hired to write code. You're hired to write profitable code. If your code fucks up something, it's your responsibility to fix it. So... If you were a smart developer, you would keep the business consequences in mind to prevent some hellscape scenario like this one. You would write your code in such a way that it not only meets the dev requirements, it also meets the business requirements. So that way no one looks bad at the end once the product releases. All this time, Swift code growth continued. 
The continued problems and slow developer environment created two warring political factions within the iOS engineers at Uber. I'll call them the Swift Zealots and the Objective C Kermadins. So the combined external pressure and internal factions meant that tensions were high. The Zealots were in denial about the problems that Swift created. The Kermadins complained about everything you could imagine without providing much in the way of solutions. Names notwithstanding. We're basically talking about people who got fed up and said, fuck this, fuck this migration, this migration sucks. And then you have a bunch of other people saying, no, 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 we just need to push a little bit more and it'll be all okay. And this is what developer dissatisfaction does. It breeds resentment. If people feel like their opinions aren't being respected, then people will just gravitate towards the next thing that will give them power, just looking smart. And I think looking smart is more of a political and ego thing in the sense that people really feel powerful when they say, no, 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 this will never work. But when you ask them to come up with a solution, they just kind of, you know, shrug their shoulders and don't really have one. And I think that's just part of human nature to really complain. And it's part of something I think a lot of people really don't look at as a developer. You know, we're focused on our code. We very much neglect the human aspect of things. And effectively, at this point, these people are just dug into their own camp, their own opinion, and refuse to cooperate or refuse to negotiate their opinion. And I think as a developer, you don't ever want to be any one of these people. You don't want to sound smart and dig in your heels and piss on public opinion. At the same time, you don't want to just like blow with whatever the wind goes because, you know, at that point, do you really have your own opinion? And can you even really think logically and rationally about things? So you don't ever want to be these people. Be someone who, if you agree or disagree, can advance the discussion by breaking new information or laying out all the arguments simply, or at least, you know, making a decision while acknowledging what points are on the table. Otherwise, you're just blocking the decision and and you're just making a bunch of noise, you're not really progressing the conversation or development effort. And you know, that's actually contrary to what your job is. I mean, on some level, your job is to protect the code, but you're also supposed to make profitable decisions for the development. And saying no, 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 all day long is not doing any of these. It was around this time that the app size problem caught up with us. I was on call and the release team was having trouble submitting the app. Turns out our brilliant solve to solve the dynamic linking problem now created a main executable that was too large for some architectures. So after fixing that problem, Aqua Geek and I did some digging and discovered that our compiled code was growing at a rate of 1.3 megabytes a week. I threw an alarm up the chain. At this rate, we would hit our cellular download limit in three weeks if we didn't do something. Okay, well, shit. Now we have two problems that are extremely urgent. The location problem that is giving us a PR and functionality nightmare, and now the app size limit that we thought we had solved before by dropping iOS 8. Well, you know, turns out it's back again. But the internal decisions were growing so strong that we were in complete denial. One of the tech leagues in the Swift camp wrote a two-page paper about how the cellular limit didn't really matter. Facebook blew past it a long time ago, and we were also really tired of fighting fires. And at this point, it's not about effort anymore. It's not about realism. It's about ideal because it's the easiest thing to say. It's easy to say, hey, I believe this and therefore we should do this. And when no one has the energy to really fight back or present facts, then, you know, these idealists just end up taking over. And none of the decisions that they make are rooted in reality. But the fact of the matter is that when you take a step back, you realize that you have to deal with what you have today or you're going to have to, have to change it. And burnout just forces people to think less logically about it because they just plain don't want to deal with issues. And uh, the irony of this is that there's never a shortage of issues. That's kind of what you sign up for when you become a programmer, that you're going to be handling a stream of bugs and a never-ending source of issues or new problems that you want to pursue. And it's because of that that a lot of people run into burnout and don't know how to manage it properly. But if I was in this situation, I think the Facebook argument is actually quite good. After all, if one company doesn't have to deal with it, why do you have to deal with it? But the real question that you should be asking yourself is why don't they have to deal with it? Were they given special permissions by Apple because they were a very big company? Or did they find some kind of permissions or technical aspect to this? Because at this point, the question isn't to revert or go forward because you've already said to full go on and accept everything that comes with it. That was a mistake that never should have happened. So the question now becomes, do you want to live with what you have today or you want to fix it? So moving on, one of our data scientists designed a test by artificially pushing one of the architecture slices over the limit and measured the effect on the business metrics. The next week, we pulled that slice back down and pushed another slice over the limit to control for architecture. And the effect was catastrophic. The negative impact was a few orders of magnitudes larger than the entire cost of the year-long Swift rewrite. Turns out, a ton of people on the cellular network, the first time they downloaded the Uber app. Imagine taking like a 10-15% profit loss just because you can't support this one feature. That's kind of the decision you're looking at here. And, and for a company that has yet to hit profitability, every little dollar counts. 
I think fortunately for this guy, he made the right call to actually look at the real data and actually look at what would happen if things were to remain the same for today. And obviously, you know, it's not going to work out. We started decompiling our object files and going over the symbols line by line to identify why our Swift code size was so much larger. We deleted unused features. Tyler had to rewrite the watch iOS app back into Objective-C. The watch app was only about 4,400 lines, but since the processor arc was different and there was no ABI compatibility, that means that we had to include an extra copy of the Swift runtime into the watch bundle. Well, you know, this isn't so bad. That can be about three weeks worth of work, depending on how familiar people are with the modules. But that's a big blow to the people who support the Swift work, and it's a mark against the entire project in retrospect. But really, now's not the time to really think about that. We were at our breaking point, so tired, but everyone rallied. This is when the brilliant engineers started to shine. One of the devs in Amsterdam figured out how to rearrange the compiler optimization pass. For those of us who aren't compiler engineers, I'll explain. Modern compilers do a ton of passes on our code. For example, one pass might inline your functions. Another might replace constant expressions with their values. Depending on the order they execute, the machine code might be smaller or larger. If your inline function gets past a constant, the compiler can reason about that. So suppose you have an int x equals three and a function that adds four to it, then it would just become a constant value of seven if the inline pass goes first, which is, you know, much less code. If inlining goes second, the constant pass won't be able to reason about the function body and you'll end up with more code. This of course all depends on what code you're writing. So it's hard to optimize the order of passes generically. So said brilliant engineer in Amsterdam built an annealing algorithm in the release build to reorder the optimization pass in such a way as to minimize size. This shaved a whopping 11 megabytes off the total machine code size and brought us enough runway to keep the development going. This terrified the Swift compiler engineers. They were worried that the untested compiler pass orders would expose untested bugs. Even though each pass is supposed to be internally safe, it's hard to reason about the possible combinations. We didn't have any major issues though. An annealing algorithm is finding the optimal solution by jittering around a value. So you'll be accepting values and random values around that one value. And then, you know, maybe random values outside of that as well. If those values consistently beat the previous value, that new value will be accepted as the new solution. And the process repeats until the jittering stops or producing better solutions. And as you progress, the range of the jittering goes smaller, smaller, and smaller. So what is the independent value we're jittering around? Because that is the optimal value that we're trying to find for. So I would say the input is the order of optimizations for the compiler. And the optimal solution we're trying to find for is the smallest app size. So it's kind of brilliant, but the randomness factor does scare the shit out of me too. After all, the drawback to annealing is that you can't really tell if this is the most optimal point out of all possible combinations. But you know, at this point, the engineers just need something that is good enough. So we applied a bunch of other solutions too, linting for code patterns that were particularly expensive. We measured each one in the number of normal development weeks that the savings unlocked. But the real problem was the growth curve. It was always eating our winnings back. Eventually, we bought enough runway to make it to Apple upping the cellular download limit to 150. They also added a couple of compiler features with the size optimizations. By their own admission, Swift will never compile as small as Objective-C. But as of this year, they've gotten Swift down to 1.5 times the machine code size of Objective-C, and they've eventually upped it to a 200 megabyte optional limit. We've had enough runway to make it a few more years. You know, this one is just being plain saved by the bell. I don't think there's really much to uh, learn here. But it is a good idea, at least, to understand under what premises your code and your environment operate under. And in this case, because they paid attention to what Apple does and what they say about their compiler and language releases, they were able to find that option in there. We almost failed, though. If Apple hadn't upped the upper limit, we would have been forced to rewrite the Uber app back into Objective-C. Eventually, we were able to fix other problems, too. The brilliant Alan Zeno and the team got Swift support added to Buck, which hugely improved build times. A bunch of people burned out along the way. Tons of money was spent, hard lessons were learned. But to this day, most people insist the rewrite was all worth it. New engineers who joined up loved the architectural consistency and never knew the pain it took to get there. So Buck is the build system that was developed by Facebook and used at Uber in order to build their apps. So being able to add a new language to that build is actually quite impressive. You're basically talking about one company convincing another company to add a feature to their a product. That's actually quite good. Imagine trying to convince Facebook of anything. And more importantly, the code base that you work on today at these big companies is built on the blood, sweat, and tears of other engineers who went through death marches like this. So it's very important, I think, at least as an exercise, for you to actually read the history and respect it in order to build off of it. I think this is something a lot of people disregard in favor of pushing out new product, but the best engineers really know where the project came from and where it's headed. That way, past mistakes are not repeated. The larger community benefited from our learnings. 
as Iwan put together an amazing presentation, we went on a speaking tour to share our knowledge. I was able to take my experience with me after I moved on and teach other teams about how to make better decisions. So my advice, everything in computer science is a trade-off. There's no universally superior language. Whatever you do, understand what the trade-offs are and why you're making them. Don't let us descend into political wars between opinionated factions. Honestly, anything is about trade-offs. Dota, computer science, engineering, life. You know, you, whatever decision you make, you can know the most optimal solutions, but if you do not know how to make the trade-offs and make a decision based on those, then it's the equivalent of doing nothing. Making good decisions requires you to be patient and understand what you're giving up in order to obtain something. If you find there are no drawbacks or benefits to something, then you're obviously not looking or thinking hard enough, or you're clouded by your own preconceived biases. Nothing in this life comes for free, and this fact is no more true than in engineering. The best thing you can have as an engineer isn't domain knowledge, is the ability to make incredibly good decisions, whatever that standard might be. Build in failure points, figure out how to identify the trade-offs, and give yourself a way out if you get to a certain point, and realize that you made a mistake. Big efforts are hard, but the cost grows the longer you make the wrong trade-off. And this is what I mentioned before. You marry yourself to the first decision, and then you marry yourself to the second decision because of the same reasons, and then so on, so on, so forth. And essentially, you're forced to double down on your previous decision just simply because you've invested so much time and effort into it and that you don't want it to go to waste. It's important to acknowledge that part of human behavior and human tendencies at the same time while recognizing that it's a fallacy. And, you know, it sucks to be that person to say, hey, this project didn't pan out. We wasted millions of dollars doing so. And someone's got to take the blame because people want to blame. Don't be a Kermageddon who doesn't contribute to the solution. Don't be a zealot who creates bigger problems for everyone else. The best engineers I've ever worked with are really good at not falling into either one of these traps. There's a reason why engineers tend to have this reputation of being these machine-like people who don't really understand human emotions because you know it, it works as a double-edged sword on one hand it makes interacting with people absolutely trash on the other hand it makes your decision making absolutely godlike um but the thing is that if you can't get other people to support your decisions then it means absolutely nothing but at the flip side having those emotions that empathy also allows you to suffer from human fallacies overall i think there's a lot of lessons that you can learn from this and this is something you guys should revisit if you're ever undertaking a large controversial project in your company. Understand that decision making, someone's got to make that decision. Someone's got to take the fall if something happens. But because that's what people expect from a leader. That's what, what, that's what people expect from a decision maker. These were the smartest people in the company making these top level decisions. And yet they also fell victim to those bad decisions caused by human fallacies. So I know this video is longer than what I'm usually used to. I put a lot of effort into this. Uh, let me know what you guys think if you want me to do more videos like this. Also, feel free to join me on my socials where you can vote for what topic I cover next. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and I'll see you all in the next one.